Excellent. So welcome everybody. Uh, today we have uh, Shuti Chawla from uh, Medicine. She'll tell us about Pandora's box. Great, thank you, Avi. Uh, this is uh, joint work with a few students at uh, Wisconsin Madison, Eva Gergatsoli, Yifeng Teng, Ruman Zhang, and my colleague, Crystal Zamos. Um, also, there's a slight affiliation change. I'm moving to UD Austin uh, later this year. Um, and uh, so this is uh, work on a problem called the Pandora's box problem. And I'll define uh, what this problem is in a moment. Uh, but let me just start by saying, um, just one minute, I should probably try to hide uh, this uh, screen so I can see my own slides well. Okay. There we go. Okay, so uh, Pandora's box is a problem that essentially models decision making under uncertainty. And there are lots and lots of settings where uh, we need to make decisions over time without knowing entirely how our decisions are going to affect our costs in the future. For example, um, back when everything was normal and I was driving to work, um, you know, there were multiple different routes I could take and which route I should take to drive to work depended on how much traffic each had. Um, and before I started driving, I didn't know how much traffic would be on each route. So here's a, a setting where I needed to make a decision without knowing uh, how it would affect uh, what I cared about, namely how quickly I would get to work. Likewise, um, another uh, setting that I've been thinking about nowadays is uh, when you're on the housing market, as I am uh, uh, in Austin, since I'm moving there, uh, you know, you look at a house and you try to figure out how much should I bid on this house without knowing uh, its uh, exact worth um, and what's going to come on the market later. Uh, this is another situation where you're making decisions uh, with some un uncertainty uh, about uh, future input that impacts uh, your uh, objective. Um, so there are many, many different situations of this sort. And the common feature here is we have limited information about uh, the input to the problem. Um, and oftentimes, we have some stochastic information about this input. So maybe we've uh, uh, encountered this problem multiple times and we uh, have seen what typical input looks like and we can use this to um, create a, a sort of a stochastic model of uh, uh, inputs that may arise in practice and we can use this stochastic information to uh, aid our decision making. And another feature uh, that is common to uh, many of these scenarios is that often you can obtain additional information at some additional cost. So maybe time and effort or actual dollars you can invest um, and obtain ad additional information. And then there's the question of, um, you know, how should you invest this time, effort or money and uh, for what sort of information that might help you better solve uh, the problem. Okay, so these are all the features that the Pandora's box problem tries to uh, incorporate in a very, very simple context. Um, so let me define uh, the original context in which uh, this problem uh, uh, was set up by Weizmann um, several decades back. Uh, so here you're given uh, a number of boxes or the algorithm is given a number of boxes and every box has a, a reward inside it. And we don't know uh, how much reward is contained inside uh, any box, but we're given distributions from which these rewards are drawn. So these are the distributions, D1, D2, et cetera. And then um, our goal is uh, ultimately to select one box and then the algorithm gets the reward that's contained inside it. Um, but the algorithm is also allowed to open the boxes at some cost. So we're going to call this cost the, the probing penalty uh, for these boxes. So these T's denote these probing penalties. And so the way the process uh, works out is uh, you pay this probing penalty T1 and maybe you decide to open box one. And when you open it, you see the reward uh, that was drawn from the distribution D1 and this reward is realized. And at this point, you can decide whether or not you want to keep this reward or you want to move on to another box and open it. 
So maybe you decide to open box three um, and then you observe the reward that's contained inside box three and this is drawn from D3. And at this point, you might decide that uh, this uh, reward in box three is large enough and you just wanna keep it. And once you make that decision, that's the end of the process. You don't get to open any other boxes and you don't get to select anything else. And you don't get anything, only the last, only the one you pick is what you get. That's correct. So like in the, the secretary the problem or, yeah. That's exactly right, yeah. So only the one you pick is the one you get. Um, and then, but you could also open this box and then go back and select this one. So that's allowed in Pandora's box. You can go back and select any of the rewards you observed so far, uh, but you do have to pay the sum of the probing penalties for opening all the boxes you opened. Okay. And we're actually going to be working with uh, a slightly different version of this problem. This is the minimization version where uh, what the boxes contain are uh, costs. So I mentioned the routing uh, example. So you can think of costs as costs for different alternatives that an algorithm could take. Um, and again, these, these costs that I'll denote by C1, C2, et cetera, are drawn from some known distributions, D1, D2, et cetera. And here, once again, you get to open boxes uh, in any sequence you like. You're going to pay the, uh, the probing penalty for opening the boxes you open. And then you must select uh, at exactly one of the boxes um, at the end of the process. And once you make your selection, the process stops. Um, and then you also pay the cost contained inside the alternative you select. Okay, so this is uh, the minimization version of the problem. I'm trying to minimize the cost of the box I select plus the probing penalty of all the boxes uh, I open. Yep. Please feel free to interrupt. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah, it's a very uh, open seminar. People feel free. Um, the distributions is, are all known in advance. Um, yes. I will come back to that point in just a little bit. We will assume that we don't have uh, uh, explicit, uh, the distributions written down explicitly, but we have sample access to these distributions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the question here uh, is, uh, we wanna come up with a strategy for solving this problem. And a strategy is really going to consist of two components. So we can, uh, we need to figure out what order to open the boxes in. And we need to figure out uh, a stopping rules for when we should stop and accept the cheapest thing we've seen so far. Okay, and I will, um, it's, it's helpful to sort of have a picture in your mind of, uh, uh, what this kind of strategy looks like. Um, and I'll call these fully adaptive strategies. I'm gonna distinguish these from other kinds of strategies in uh, just a little bit. So what are these strategies? So again, the, there's a probing order we need to determine which is the order in which we open boxes. And there's a stopping time, the time at which we stop and select the best box we've seen so far. And this, uh, the probing order in particular, this can look like a, a tree of decisions. So uh, for example, you could start by probing box one, and then depending on what the cost of this box turned out to be, you could have different actions that the strategy takes. So it might decide to open some other box, depending on what the cost was, um, or it might decide to stop and select uh, the first box. And then uh, we continue forward uh, in this manner. So you probe box two, and now you could use the costs you've seen in both boxes one and two to determine what to do later. Okay, so in general, uh, this is what a strategy for this problem is going to look like. And here I've just written this mathematically. Uh, so the next element in the ordering is a function of everything we've seen so far. And whether or not we stop at a particular step is also a function of everything we've seen so far in general. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, do you allow yeah. randomization or uh, in the algorithm or will you, or does it, does it help to randomize so in the setting? In the setting, it does not help to randomize, I believe. 
So you will anyway you will look only at deterministic yeah. algorithms. I will look only at deterministic. Um, actually, um, randomization might help. I'm going to actually compete against a special class of uh, strategies, which I will come to in just a moment, and those are not going to be uh, uh, randomized. Uh, although we will use randomness in designing our algorithm to compete against those. Oh, you will. So the algorithms will be randomized. Okay. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. So we are. Um, so this is the objective written uh, in uh, terms of these uh, quantities I define. So we stop at some point, I'm gonna denote that by tau. Um, and I'm gonna just make the simplifying assumption that the probing penalty we pay is just the number of boxes we open. Uh, this is not important for the uh, results I uh, describe later. Uh, it's, uh, the results are going to work for general probing penalties, but it just helps our discussion to make the simplification. Um, and then this is going to be the cost of the solution we pick in the end. This is the minimum of the CIs we have seen so far. Okay. So this is what we want to minimize. And if the algorithm is randomized, then we take expectations over the randomness in the algorithm, but note that there's also randomness in the input. So this expectation is taken over that as well. Okay. So as I said, Weitzman defined uh, the maximization version of the problem uh, several decades back, and in fact, also provided an algorithm for solving uh, this problem. And the algorithm is uh, really simple and beautiful. Um, I'm going to describe it uh, very briefly, uh, but the actual algorithm is not relevant to the results I talk about later. So don't worry if you don't get all the details. But basically what this algorithm does is for every box, it uh, calculates a kind of amortized cost. Um, and in some contexts, this is uh, the same uh, amortized cost that's also known as the Giddens index, uh, if you've heard this term before. And so it computes this uh, index for every box independently. Uh, and this depends on the distribution of costs inside the box. And then what it does is to probe the boxes. Uh, so it, it sort of pretends that the indices are really the true costs contained inside the boxes and there's no probing cost at all. So the way it, it does this amortization is it says that um, if I pick a particular box, I'm going to pay uh, uh, more than my share of the probing penalty for this box. But if I don't pick this box, then I'm not going to pay any probing cost at all. And in expectation, my costs are going to turn out to be just right. They're gonna be computed, uh, uh, they're amortized in just the right way. So, as, so at a very high level, this is how it works. So what it does is it computes these indices and then it opens the boxes in greedy order of these indices. So it starts with the smallest one and then goes to the next one, the next one and so on. And as it opens boxes, it observes the costs contained inside. And as soon as it finds a box with a cost that is smaller than all of the remaining indices, it stops and selects that box. Okay. And so in pictorial terms, the algorithm looks something like this. Um, it computes these indices. It orders the boxes in increasing order of these indices. And note that this is now a fixed uh, ordering. So it's no longer the case that I'm going to determine this ordering based on what I observe in this box. Uh, but whether or not to stop depends on comparing these costs against the largest index that remains uh, so far, that remains in the future. Okay. And Weitzman showed that, in fact, uh, if uh, the cost distributions, uh, D1 through Dn, uh, if they're independent, then this algorithm is optimal. It's the best over all possible fully adaptive strategies. Um, and note that this is, this is a very simple kind of uh, strategy. So essentially he uh, showed that the optimal solution takes on this, uh, this simple form. 
And in fact, I'm going to give a name to this kind of uh, strategy. We're going to call it partially adaptive. Partially adaptive because the ordering uh, in which we open boxes is independent of the instantiated cost. So this ordering is not adaptive. But the stopping time, of course, will depend on what we've seen so far. So this component is uh, adaptive. Okay. So Weitzman showed that a partially adaptive strategy is optimal in this case. And since his work, there's been uh, uh, there have been a number of applications of um, uh, Pandora's box to different kinds of settings where you might select multiple boxes or you might, you might have constraints on what you can select. And essentially this, this solution generalizes uh, very nicely to a number of these settings. And I won't talk about these in detail, but here are some references uh, if anyone wants to explore this further. Okay. Should so you, what about, I, yeah, go ahead. So, uh, Sorry, can I ask something? Are these mm -hmm. costs dependent only on DI or do they depend on the product distribution? So in Weitzman's setting, the DIs are all independent and every cost is going to be drawn uh, independently then from its respective DI. Sorry, like the, the Gittins, like the amortized cost. Oh, the, the Giddens index. Yes. So this is computed uh, uh, for every box independently. So I can look at box one, just look at DI and PI. Um, and then compute its index. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So now the setting that I want to talk about um, is a setting where these costs are going to be correlated. Uh, so there's some joint distribution D, uh, and D could be some very large support joint distribution. And I'm going to draw the entire cost vector from uh, this joint distribution D. Okay. And since we're talking about joint distributions now, these distributions could be very, very complicated and very large support. And so we're going to assume that the algorithm does not have an explicit description of this distribution, but rather has sample access to this distribution. So I can draw any number of samples I like from the distribution, and I can make my decisions based on uh, these samples. And you can draw them also during the algorithm at various points or only in the beginning? We can draw them uh, if we like. Uh, I mean, we could always uh, draw the right number of samples uh, at the beginning and then use these during the algorithm. And uh, that's it how- may not be, It may not be the same, right? I mean, may, you, may be, uh, you may believe that you don't need many samples and then maybe the choices that you, I mean, the things revealed to you require make you, to you realize you yeah. want more samples. That's right, that could very well happen. Um, and one of the things we cannot uh, do here is to, uh, or at least uh, as I stated uh, in the model, uh, we can't draw uh, uh, samples under conditioning. So we uh, can't, don't necessarily, we're not necessarily able to say you know, draw a sample for me where C1 takes on a particular value, for example. Um, okay. So sometimes that can be valuable and uh, but that can also have a large sample complexity. Um, so what we are going to assume is, um, so our algorithm will just draw some small number of samples at the beginning, uh, and then we will make decisions based on those. Okay. So uh, just to reiterate the model once more, uh, we have uh, the setting with boxes uh, and boxes contain costs inside them. And these costs are drawn from some joint distribution. And I'm going to call uh, every possible um, vector of costs that, uh, is, uh, uh, that can be instantiated from this distribution. I'm gonna call these uh, vector scenarios. So there's a distribution over possible scenarios and we draw one scenario uh, for the algorithm. And again, we can open every box at a penalty of one. And our goal is to open some number of boxes uh, and select a single box so as to minimize the cost contained in the box we select plus the total number of boxes we open. And what about the cost of the sample? 
Uh, there's no cost of, uh, of drawing samples, but we do want the sample complexity of the algorithm to be small or polynomial in the, the, the uh, right parameters. And uh, it'll turn out, uh, just looking ahead, that uh, the number of samples our algorithm requires is uh, polynomial in the number of boxes. Okay. So about uh, n cubed is uh, sufficient. Okay. So um, unlike in uh, Weizmann's setting with independent distributions, in this setting, it turns out that the optimal strategy can be fully adaptive. It's not necessarily partially adaptive. And it also turns out that competing against these uh, arbitrary fully adaptive strategies is pretty much hopeless in the setting where we only have sample access to the distribution. And let me give a really quick example showing you that. Um, so uh, here uh, the, uh, I've set up uh, a Pandora's box problem where I have some n number of boxes. And in this context, uh, what's going to happen is that uh, box one is going to, uh, uh, so every box other than box one is going to have cost either zero or infinity in every scenario. Um, so every scenario is going to have one special box that uh, has zero cost, and that's the box we want to find. And box one is going to encode the, the location of this uh, one scenario. Okay, so if this encoding is, kind of, is a nice encoding that we can invert, then we just probe this box one. We learn the identity of this uh, uh, good box that contains zero cost. We probe that box and we stop uh, and select that box. So that's the optimal uh, algorithm, optimal strategy in this case. Um, and so the optimal cost is, is just two. Uh, but if f is some hard to invert function and uh, then we cannot hope to learn this, uh, uh, the, the cannot hope to learn this mapping from uh, the cost in the first box to uh, the identity of the, the, uh, the good box um, using few samples. Uh, and so this is pretty much a hopeless uh, scenario and the algorithm necessarily needs to probe many boxes to find the right one. But, but is it, um, you know, if you didn't have a hardness assumption, a computational hardness, do you also know that it needs to be fully adapted? Without, so, you know, suppose information theoretically is possible to find a gap between uh, fully adaptive and uh, is it hopeless so, if you are totally computationally powerful? Um, so I could hide the identity of this box in, um, uh, so that's a, a good question. Um, yeah, so this, this does need a, a, a hardness assumption. Yeah. Yeah, so if, uh, um, so here it, it's a question of, you know, can I uh, obtain, uh, so I could have a distribution over uh, these uh, cost function, these scenarios, and is it sufficient for me to obtain a small number of samples from this distribution to invert this function? So, um, Yeah, um, so I would, yeah, it, it requires a hardness assumption, yeah. Okay, as far yeah. as you know. <laughs> yes, yeah. as far as I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're going to simplify the objective here and instead of competing against these fully uh, adaptive strategies, we are going to compete against uh, just partially adaptive strategies. Um, and why partially adaptive? Because we know that in, in some contexts, these do contain the optimal solution. And uh, uh, in, uh, uh, and they're reasonable strategies in a realistic uh, uh, setting where you determine uh, beforehand uh, what order to probe the solutions in, uh, but you still want to figure out what the best uh, order is. So okay. Shuchi, uh, yeah. you use several times compete against, and I'm not sure everybody in the audience is familiar with what this means. So can you? Yes. Okay. So um, what I mean by uh, uh, compete against, so there's, um, 
so our goal uh, is uh, a sort of um, uh, is basically an approximation ratio where we say that uh, the expected cost of the algorithm is going to be not much larger than uh, the expected cost of the optimum. And I'm using the word compete as opposed to uh, approximate the optimal partially adaptive strategy because this is a, a sort of uh, online context where uh, we don't necessarily uh, have all of the information to find uh, the, the, the optimal um, strategy. Um, and so, uh, so competing is, is a term that comes from uh, online algorithms where you are uh, trying to approximate an unachievable optimum. So that's, that's the, the sense in which I am uh, using this term. Okay, so I wanna quickly mention here a related line of work, which is uh, very similar to what we are talking about here. Um, so there's uh, something called the optimal decision tree problem, which is in many ways very similar. You're trying to learn an optimal uh, um, uh, decision tree, but the typical assumption in this line of work is that the number of scenarios is uh, small and it allows both um, uh, a running time that depends polynomially on the number of scenarios, and it also allows um, uh, approximation factors uh, that, are, that depend in some way on the number of scenarios. So we are uh, explicitly, and this example uh, that I described is explicitly set up for a, a setting where the number of scenarios could be very, very large, and we, um, don't have an explicit description of the distribution uh, uh, given to us. Um, and so uh, we don't want either our running time or our approximation ratio to depend on the size of this uh, distribution. Okay, so what makes this uh, setting uh, uh, challenging is that Unlike in Weizmann's setting, there is, uh, uh, to our knowledge, there's no nice structure in what this optimal ordering is. So in Weizmann's setting, the, it was possible to come up with an index independently for every box um, that provided this ordering to us. Um, and the stopping rule was also simple. And in this setting, it's not clear that, um, uh, that such a nice structure exists. And in fact, it's also not clear that there is a succinct description of the optimal partially adaptive strategy. So um, going back to what these partially adaptive strategies look like, uh, the ordering is something that's, uh, that we fix in advance uh, and is independent of uh, instantiated costs. But the stopping rule here could be arbitrarily complicated. Um, and will be for, for optimal uh, uh, strategies. Um, and so it's not clear how you might uh, succinctly describe the stopping rule, for example. Okay, and this is one of the things that makes uh, this uh, challenging to look at. And the first thing we're going to do in order to uh, make progress on this problem is to define a further um, simpler class uh, of, uh, of strategies, uh, but this is going to be a class of strategies that, uh, in, uh, uh, that in reality are not going to be realizable as in we're assuming extra information that we don't have, uh, but we're going to start with thinking about uh, these uh, uh, extra powerful strategies and then think about how to massage them into uh, a realistic uh, strategy. So I'm going to call these uh, scenario aware probing strategies. And what these are going to do is uh, we're again going to have an ordering uh, for probing boxes that is independent of the instantiated costs. But the stopping rule now is going to be uh, uh, simplified. And I'm going to assume that I can, uh, um, that the strategy is able to look into the future, observe all of the costs, and then decide where to stop and select a box, okay? So uh, let me be a little more precise. So what we're going to do in these scenario aware strategies is to fix uh, a particular probing order 
And then as we probe the boxes, we're going to assume that the algorithm learns which scenario it's in. So recall that scenarios correspond to cost vectors. So I probe box one, and let's say that I know that uh, I'm in scenario three, so I know precisely what the entire cost vector is. And if I'm in the scenario, I'm going to stop and select this box. And if I'm not in the scenario, then I'm going to probe the next box. Uh, and then if I'm in scenario two or nine, these again correspond to certain cost vectors, then I'm going to stop and select the better of these two. And if I'm not in any of these scenarios, then I move forward in my ordering. Okay, so here we're again going to fix an ordering without knowing which scenario we're in, uh, but the stopping time is going to be a function of the scenario. Okay, so what is my net cost here? So uh, I, this is, uh, I'm going to fix an ordering, but then this is an expectation over the costs we observe. And for any fixed scenario, I am going to look at the, uh, uh, I'm going to look at all the cost vectors and I'm going to stop at the best place for that scenario. So if I stop at position I, then, um, then in that scenario, my cost would be this uh, I for the number of boxes I probed plus the cost of the ith box that I selected. And I'm going to pick an I for the scenario that minimizes the sum. And this gives me the net cost for that scenario. And then I take the expectation over these cost vectors. So the good thing about these scenario aware strategies, so I already said that these are strategies we cannot really implement in practice because we don't have this, uh, we can't look ahead and figure out which scenario we're in. But the good thing about these is uh, we'll show that when the number of scenarios is small, uh, so it's some polynomial, uh, it's something enumerated, then we'll be able to find the uh, find an approximately optimal uh, scenario aware partially adaptive strategy. And then we'll show how to convert this into a partially adaptive strategy that doesn't need to know the scenario. Okay. So before I uh, go further into this and state the results formally, uh, I want to take a little digression and uh, just give you um, sort of a, a high level overview of where uh, uh, I believe this, this kind of work fits in um, within the framework of algorithm design. And to do that, let me just go back right at the beginning where uh, in uh, TCS and algorithm design, our favored um, uh, model of analysis uh, uh, started out as a worst case analysis where uh, we wanna show that an algorithm performs well on every uh, input instance. And, uh, oh, uh, and a parallel line of work uh, along this time has been uh, to establish models for stochastic analysis, because in many settings, worst case analysis does not give us a satisfactory answer or gives us a, a too pessimistic of an answer. And stochastic analysis says that we're given some um, you know, fixed uh, distribution that we believe the, the input is drawn from. And we only, we wanna fine tune our algorithm to work well on this particular class of uh, instances and not necessarily on every possible instance. And over the last few years, there's been this new paradigm uh, of data-driven algorithm design that has uh, come up where uh, this model of having sample access to the input distribution uh, fits in. So here the idea is you observe uh, actual input over previous instances of the algorithm. And the straightforward way of, of applying this approach would be to learn a model or let's say an empirical distribution over uh, the observed instances and then fine tune your algorithm for it. But there are alternate ways of approaching data-driven algorithm design where you say, well, I'm going to fix some parameterized class of algorithms, and then I'm gonna directly tune these parameters based on data. Um, or I'm going to learn the right algorithm from this class, uh, sort of like how in machine learning, we learn concepts from a given class using data. And this has been applied in, in several uh, 
uh, on several problems very successfully. Uh, but within this new paradigm, one might ask the question of, uh, you know, what is this right parameterized class uh, of algorithms uh, over which you should tune your parameters or over which you learn from data? And I want to um, propose uh, a, a combination of these uh, different paradigms or different approaches that brings in uh, a worst case aspect to uh, data-driven algorithm design. And uh, here uh, we're going to have a, a three-fold goal, which says that um, I'm, uh, I'm in this uh, data-rich setting, I'm going to find uh, some class of algorithms uh, uh, that I'll call C here, which uh, can not only be learned over well, so we can uh, optimize over C or we can learn the best algorithm over C using low sample complexity uh, and uh, in a computationally efficient manner, but also at the same time, this class C um, is, uh, it always contains approximately optimal solutions, even in the worst case. So this, this basically brings together these two different uh, approaches where it, it says that we want a class that is at once expressive in the worst case sense and is learnable in this data-driven uh, sense. And this is the sort of guarantee we will be able to achieve for uh, the Pandora's box problem. Okay. So coming back to Pandora's box, uh, essentially, our, uh, our main result says that we can learn an approximately optimal, partially adaptive strategy efficiently from data. And this, uh, this has three components along the lines that I described on the previous slide. So what we're going to do is to identify a class of partially adaptive strategies. And this class is going to have the following uh, three properties. So first of all, for every joint distribution, in the worst case, this class is always going to contain an approximately optimal strategy. Okay. Second, we're going to be able to learn the optimal strategy in this class using few samples. Uh, and few here means poly in N, meaning that I can draw, uh, uh, this is going to turn out to be uh, about uh, n cubed, I can draw n cubed samples from the underlying distribution. And now uh, just based on those samples and no further knowledge about the distribution, I can find uh, the best strategy in C and I can use this uh, strategy. And furthermore, finding this uh, uh, best strategy in C, this is a problem that can be, uh, this is uh, NP hard, but we can approximate it uh, losing some small uh, constant uh, in approximation. Okay. So, uh, question. Yes. When, when you say in the worst case about theorem one, this is worst case over the choice of distribution or worst case over what? Worst yeah. case over the choice of the distribution. That's correct. Yeah. So, for every distribution, there's going to be one uh, strategy in C that uh, is approximately optimal. And the rest is in expectation or with high probability or something. Um, so you mean uh, the, the other yeah, two terms? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, this is, uh, so, so theorem two is sort of a, a pack learning result. So it's basically okay. um, saying that if I draw uh, N cubed samples and if I find the best strategy uh, in C, uh, with respect to uh, those samples, then this strategy uh, is also, um, uh, you know, one minus one over poly n close to optimal over the okay. original distribution. So it's in, it's in okay. a pack learning sense. Yeah. Um, and then theorem three is basically saying that now that I draw, I, I have drawn these samples, so I now have n cubed different samples. I now have an explicit distribution, the empirical distribution over these n cubed samples. How do I find the best strategy in C over these, uh, uh, over this uh, small support distribution now? Um, so that problem can be uh, solved uh, approximately uh, with uh, this approximation ratio in a computationally efficient manner. 
So this is again, uh, theorem three is again a worst case result because this uh, uh, distribution could be arbitrary. And this is a worst case approximation ratio for that problem. Does that address your question? Yeah, it does. I'm just wondering if it may be more general. Uh, maybe this set of theorems applies not only to Pandora's box, but to a, a larger setting of uh, problems. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's a, that's a great question. So um, it turns out, so I will actually show you the uh, proofs of theorems one and two very shortly. These are uh, very simple to describe once we set down what this class P is. Um, and so theorem one is very, very general, uh, as you'll see shortly. Uh, theorem two requires uh, costs to be bounded, uh, and, uh, but otherwise it's fairly general. Again, theorem three uh, is uh, we're going to have some extensions to different feasibility constraints, uh, but this is the part that becomes uh, harder to uh, prove as you go to more and more general settings. Okay. Okay, so let me describe uh, where theorems one and two come from. And I will be able to give you pretty much a, a complete uh, argument for these theorems with a slightly uh, worse uh, approximation factor here. Um, and I said, these are uh, really almost direct once I tell you what this class of strategies is. So here's what we are going to do. Uh, so recall that Partially adaptive strategies uh, specify an ordering in which to open boxes, and then also specify uh, when to stop and accept the best uh, box you've seen so far. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to still specify some ordering, but I'm going to simplify the stopping rule. And this stopping rule is going to be um, basically, uh, I'll call this a myopic stopping rule. And if you've seen um, something like the ski rental problem, then this will look very, very familiar to you. So basically what the stopping rule says is that uh, I'm opening these boxes in, uh, in sequence defined by th this ordering that I selected. And I'm going to keep track of how much I paid in probing penalty. Okay. And as soon as I find a box that has cost inside it that's no more than the probing penalty I've paid so far, I'm going to stop and select that box. Okay, so we're going to call this myopic stopping. And as I said, this is very much like the solution, classical solution to the ski rental problem, if you've seen that before. And before I describe why this is a worst case approximately optimal, let me just say that uh, this class is now parameterized by uh, the different possible orderings over boxes uh, I might have um, because the stopping rule is now simple and fixed once I fix an ordering. There's just one stopping rule um, I have. And so the size of this class is bounded. And uh, it turns out that the, the costs of any strategy uh, in this class are also bounded. And those together suffice to give me this back learning style uh, result here in theorem two. Okay, so in particular, the number of samples I require to get this theorem turns out to be uh, related to the, the log of the size of this class. And this class only has n factorial strategies in it. It's a VC dimension argument. It's a VC dimension argument, exactly right. Okay, so why does this, uh, this simple stopping rule give us uh, an approximately optimal solution? This, uh, this argument is uh, very similar again to the ski rental problem. Um, and I'll, I'll describe it using this picture here. So this uh, X axis in this picture is basically the probing time. So as I open more and more boxes, I'm going moving forward uh, along the X axis. And the y-axis is going to represent costs. And so the, the blue line here is the cost of the best box I've seen so far. So over time, this drops because I see better and better boxes. 
And this orange line is my probing penalty that I'm paying by opening more and more boxes. So this increases over time. And the green line is the total cost I pay. So this is the sum of the orange and the blue. And this myopic stopping, what it's doing is it's saying that I'm going to stop at the first time where the orange line crosses the blue line. And what am I going to pay? I'm going to pay the sum of the orange and the blue. So I'm going to pay basically twice uh, uh, where this point is. Okay. And now observe that uh, what the optimal thing pays is uh, if you look at this green line. So I've plotted all of these for uh, some particular fixed scenario. So for every scenario where the optimal stopping for that ordering of the boxes is going to be at the minimum of this uh, green line. But the green line is always going to stay above this, uh, uh, the, the max of the, the blue and the orange. Okay, so of course the green cost is going to be at least as large as where this crossing point is. Okay, so in particular, twice this, this crossing point, which is the, uh, the cost that the algorithm pays, is going to be no more than twice uh, the, the best green cost. Okay, and that, that's what this factor of two is saying here. It says that if I stop here, I'm within a factor of two of green. So, so the sum here is going to be no more than twice the best point here. And this uh, just uses the monotonicity of the cost of probing, right? It would be the same if it was not linear. That's exactly right. So in fact, um, we could even have a cost function, a, a probing cost that is a function of, uh, that's a set function of the boxes we open and uh, it still works out uh, in that context. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, and then to get the, the better than two, the E over E minus one, there's a, a, a randomized uh, a strategy for the ski rental problem. And it basically applies to the setting uh, pretty much as is. Okay. So that was the, the first two theorems here. And basically what these theorems buy us is they tell us that uh, what we need to do is draw these polynomially many samples. And then over these samples, we want to find the approximately best strategy in this simple class with myopic stopping. That's what we wanna do. So that's, that's the, uh, the problem we're left over with now. So we have some number, some small number of scenarios and we want to find the, the ordering that uh, coupled with the myopic stopping rule is approximately optimal. And it's still uh, a little bit challenging to think about this because uh, it's difficult to anticipate uh, what the cost of this myopic stopping is going to turn out to be. And so this is where we will now shift to scenario aware strategies and we'll say, well, we're, we're, we're going to find uh, uh, an ordering that minimizes, uh, for which the hindsight optimal stopping, the scenario aware stopping, is going to be approximately optimal. And because myopic stopping is close to uh, within this E over E minus one factor, it's close to hindsight optimal stopping, we'll be in good shape. Okay, so again, this is a scenario aware strategy and we're going to now optimize for orderings uh, with just uh, uh, coupled with scenario aware stopping rule. Okay, and uh, I won't spend a whole lot of time on this. Uh, let me uh, just say that uh, there's a special case of this problem that's been uh, extensively studied before. This is where all of the boxes contain costs that are zero or infinity. Uh, but of course, uh, observing these infinities may give us some information about where the right, where the zeros are. So really what we want to figure out is we want to order uh, these uh, boxes uh, in such an order that uh, once we start op opening the boxes, the amount of time it takes us to find a zero um, is uh, as small as possible in expectation. Um, and this is called the min sum set cover problem because this is essentially like uh, uh, the covering scenarios using these zero cost boxes, uh, but we don't have a single 
um, scenario to cover, but rather uh, we have this uh, distribution over scenarios and we want to minimize the expected time uh, to cover them. So there's a lot of work on uh, min sum set cover and a number of variants of this. Um, it turns out that uh, the best approximation known for this uh, is uh, a four approximation, and there's also a hardness uh, of four here. So this is a, a very well studied and uh, pretty much solved problem. And in fact, there are multiple different ways of uh, getting uh, this um, um, uh, this four approximation here. Okay. So, um, excuse me for a minute, uh, a window just popped up on my screen somehow, and I'm going to, yeah. Okay. So, um, the, this is very well studied. In our context, uh, the, the setting is a little bit more challenging because uh, when we open a box and observe its cost, it's not immediately apparent whether we should select this box or move forward. In min sum set cover, as soon as you find a zero, you can stop. So uh, again, this is a matter of uh, knowing when to stop. And that's where scenario aware PA strategies can come, uh, come in and help us. Um, so what we do is to develop an LP rounding approach for this. Um, and uh, I'll very, very, very briefly say what this is. So basically, we first um, uh, use, uh, we first write a linear program uh, to capture um, uh, fractional relaxations of scenario aware uh, strategies. Essentially, what this linear program amounts to is writing down permutation constraints, which uh, capture um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically um, uh, matchings or uh, uh, or uh, you know a permutation matrix, um, and then uh, once we have these set down, we have other variables that describe whether or not uh, you can uh, select a, a, a particular box at a particular time for a particular scenario. So that's what these extra constraints are doing. And what these first few constraints give us is a distribution over uh, permutations, uh, essentially. Um, and uh, one sort of immediate idea that uh, uh, comes to mind when you see this is to say, well, I'm just going to pick a permutation from this distribution and maybe that will have uh, a good cost. And that turns out to not be uh, the case because this LP can, um, uh, can, do its, uh, um, can do its box selections in uh, a clever way in order to reduce its uh, eventual cost so that just selecting a random permutation from uh, these constraints is not going to capture properly uh, the costs defined by selecting boxes. So instead, um, in order to round the solution, what we need to do is for every scenario, we need to look at the right prefix of uh, this uh, permutation matrix, and we need to select a, a sort of a random partial permutation from that prefix, and that determines the box selection costs appropriately. And um, so I'm going to skip over some of these details. I'm happy to go over these uh, afterwards if anybody is interested. Uh, but let me just say that, uh, um, yeah, let me just say that um, the, the, the prefix that we should select for every scenario de depends on what that scenario is. But we use a, a sort of standard doubling trick where we say that we're going to look at a prefix of size one. Um, and select some boxes for that prefix. Then we're gonna look at a prefix of size two, select some boxes, then a prefix of size four and eight and so on. And by looking at these um, uh, prefixes of, of uh, lengths that double every time, we make sure that for every scenario, we find some prefix that, uh, that closely matches the right thing to do for that scenario, while also making sure that we haven't spent too much cost in the past few iterations. So it doesn't add up uh, to too much. 
Um, and so uh, this sort of rounding idea gives us our eventual ordering over boxes. Um, and we're able to show that the, uh, the loss in, uh, in cost relative to what the, uh, the linear program pays is only uh, uh, some constant factor turns out to be close to six. Okay. And uh, so, this is the only place to use randomization, right? In the round. That's correct. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So let me just reiterate, you know, at a high level what the algorithm looks like. Um, so we, we draw some polynomial number of samples from the distribution. We set up the linear program on these samples uh, and we solve this linear program. And then we use this uh, LP rounding approach uh, the, uh, using this doubling trick in phases. Uh, and what we do you, uh, uh, through this LP rounding is to find a good probing order. And then we use this probing order along with the myopic stopping rule to get the final uh, strategy. Uh, and this gives us the final algorithm. And there's some loss uh, in approximation from this LP rounding. And then there's some loss in approximation from uh, going from uh, a scenario aware stopping in the second step to a myopic stopping in the third step. And that gives us this final approximation factor uh, turns out to be uh, uh, between nine and 10. Okay. And a similar approach works uh, in slightly more general settings. So if you have a Pandora's box problem where you must select K boxes uh, for some K larger than one, then uh, we have a, a slightly different LP rounding approach, but most uh, at a high level, the strategy looks pretty much the same. And this also uh, gives a constant factor uh, approximation uh, independent of K. And then there are some settings where you have a further uh, a more general feasibility constraint on how many boxes you should select and which boxes you can select. And if this is given by a metroid, then uh, again, a similar uh, approach works. And this time we get an approximation that depends on the rank of the metroid, uh, log logarithmic in the rank of the metroid. And I want to quickly mention here uh, that there are some computational hardness uh, results uh, uh, just based off of uh, um, P not equal to NP. And uh, so these lower bounds, these uh, are basically say that um, if you, uh, that you cannot get an approximation factor uh, better than these quantities here unless P is equal to NP. And in fact, these lower bounds hold also if you want to use the full power of fully adaptive strategies. So here we're approximating uh, the optimal partially adaptive strategy, and we're producing a partially adaptive strategy in order to do so. Here for these lower bounds, we allow the algorithm to, to produce a fully adaptive strategy. So use adaptivity to its advantage, but we also restrict the optimum to uh, to not even use partial adaptivity to, in fact, we limit the optimum to be non-adaptive, meaning that it just selects some subset of the boxes and it opens them and it returns the best of these boxes. Uh, it selects the best of these boxes. So it's completely uh, non-adaptive. And even such a restricted optimum cannot be approximated, uh, uh, cannot, cannot be found exactly. So there's some gap in how well we can do. So those are uh, our results, and I will uh, now conclude. I'm nearly out of time. Um, so there are uh, several interesting open directions here. Uh, one could get an improved approximation. Uh, one could ask, uh, you know, I can't approximate uh, the optimal fully adaptive strategy. I can approximate the optimal partially adaptive strategy. Is there some other class of uh, strategies in between uh, that uh, one can, that are approximable uh, and that are achievable. Um, and then uh, I mentioned uh, at the beginning several examples that have a combinatorial structure to them. Uh, for example, the routing problem, uh, finding uh, shortest paths. 
Um, and these combinatorial problems don't fit into uh, the, the, like the Metroid constraint setting, the most general setting I talked about. Um, and so uh, one can pose uh, Pandora's box types of questions in those settings uh, as well. And these are all interesting directions. Uh, but most of all, uh, I think this approach to data-driven algorithm design um, that uh, tries to bring in both a worst case element and a learning uh, element is interesting and I hope will catch on uh, in other contexts as well. Okay, that's it, uh, thank you, I'll take questions. Oh, that was great, thanks a lot. Okay, questions to... Uh... Any questions? Well, I'll start with a question then. Uh, uh, so one one question is: uh, It seems that you described that uh, you know you, you mentioned that uh, uh, the results were, which deal with the case that distribution has a small support, mm -hmm. where uh, you can employ some uh, you know other techniques because uh, distribution has small support. But it seems that this is part of your solution. So it seems like uh, because you are, uh, you know, you are basically in a pack setting where the VC dimension is small, one step of your solution is just reducing the support to be small by sampling. That's right. Right, That's And right. you know that the sample is small and then you are in a small support setting, right? This, this family of permutations from which you can later optimize yes. is already a small support one. That you can uh, write right. a linear, an explicit linear program for, right? So it separates the two. You you go to a small support by picking, I guess, <laughs> cleverly the set of the set of uh, you know strategies you are competing against, and then uh, you you optimize or approximately optimize over that. That's exactly right. Yeah. So I should say that uh, you know the choice of. Uh, the strategies I'm optimizing over, so partially adaptive strategies, affected, uh, you know, uh, uh, had an effect on both of these components. So we don't know how to do the pack learning component uh, for, for fully adaptive strategies. It's not clear whether, uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, whether there's a pack learning result there. Uh, I doubt there is. Uh, and then once we have small support too, it's not clear that we can, uh, so in fact, uh, it's believed that uh, there's a, um, a, a hardness there that we cannot get a constant factor approximation even over small support. So the, the optimal decision tree results I mentioned for small support, they get approximations that are uh, logarithmic in the size of the support, um, which uh, I, believe is also possible for the Pandora's box setting uh, for small support. You can get logarithmic in the size of the support. Um, it's um, the hardness results there are constant factor hardness, uh, but I think there's uh, uh, there's a feeling in that uh, community that the hardness really is, uh, uh, is super constant for that problem. Mm -hmm. Alex has a question. You want to ask it verbally? It's in the chat. Um, let me see if I can look at the chat. You see it, or I can read. Run me yeah. function and game theory related to this topic. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know. I uh, I would have to look it up. Yeah, Thank I think you. it's for, for simpler games. That's my feeling. I mean, I'm not sure I uh, know what it is, but it, it seems to me that it's for simpler type of games. I'm not sure, yeah. Uh, more questions? Anybody? So I, I'm just wondering, economists, I guess economists started this, right? Weizmann was an economist. So is that, are they interested in this uh, kind of extensions? Yes, so um, indeed, so, uh, you know, there are many settings where we see correlations creep up and there have been, you know, few uh, of these problems that, where, that can handle correlations. So you mentioned profit inequalities at the, the very beginning, and that's a very related kind of model where we also observe that uh, 
uh, the, the independent distribution setting we understand very well, and there are many generalizations, but the correlated setting uh, uh, turns out to be very challenging and uh, um, we only have sparse results here and there. Um, so uh, I, uh, this is, uh, yeah, this comes up as a, a, a special case in many different um, uh, mechanism design settings, uh, for instance, which is optimization in uh, economic or strategic context. No, I'm sure it arises in statistics and economics. I'm just wondering whether these people in these communities are interested. Are interested in, in yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, a lot of the the older work here uh, is uh, from more from the optimal stopping community more so than the economics community. Um, connections have uh, exist and and have been uh, noted, but I haven't seen particularly you know the, the theory work or or algorithmic work from that community. Mm -hmm. More questions? Anybody? All right. So otherwise, let's thank uh, Suchi again. Well, great. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks all right. Me. See you all.